Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Clark Energy and INEO webinar, Embedded Gas Engine Generation Enabling Green. My name is Kirsten Hill and I am the Event Manager for Data Centres Island. Please visit the Data Centres Island website to view on-demand content from exhibitors and supporters and the virtual festival on demand. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the Data Centres Island website. If you have any questions, please put these in the chat box and they will be addressed at the end. And now over to Ed Ansett, Chairman and Co-Founder at i3 Solutions Group. Thanks very much, Kirsten. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the seminar. Um, this is a, an amazingly interesting subject um, and uh, we have a fantastic panel uh, to, to discuss various aspects of um, embedded gas generation and the benefits of that. Uh, particularly in the Irish context, but I think you, there's a lot of takeaways for this that, that you'll be able to apply globally. Um, I just think it's important um, for people in the data centre sector, those that, of you that know me know I've spent the last too long in the data centre sector as a consulting engineer. Um, I think this is probably one of the most significant, this topic is one of the most significant, fascinating and important topics that's going to affect the data centre industry from now for the foreseeable future in the context of um, uh, sustainability and enhanced reliability um, for data center of owners and operators. Just, um, just so you know, so the people that we have on the panel from, are from various, um, various uh, areas. Um, uh, we'll, we'll go through the introductions properly, but as you can see on the screen, uh, we've got David Mitteltree, um, and John Sedgwick, uh, Sean Crowley, and John Curley, and they'll do their own introductions in just a second. I think what we're hoping we will achieve today from an audience perspective, one of the key things we hope we achieve today is to do two things. One is to um, give you some confidence that there is a lot of expertise out there in the industry in terms of gas generation, and that can very easily be applied to data centers. Um, the data center industry, I think, is on the cusp of adoption, as I say, adoption of gas generation at early stages, but I personally believe, and of course this is recorded, so it's going to come back at me if I'm wrong, I personally believe this is the future. Um, so we've got a lot of experience on the panel, and the aim really today is to talk about application, particularly in the Irish context, but as I say, also in a, in a more global context, and to demystify some of the, some of the, some of the um, issues surrounding gas, uh, gen gas engine generation, um, particularly in the context of data centers. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to um, pass that, um, hang on, sorry, should have known who's up first. Yes, to John Sedgwick, please. Uh, John, if you'd introduce yourself and, um, uh, and take it from here. Morning, morning all. Um, so yeah, my name's John Sedgwick. I work for a company called Electricity Exchange. Um, Electricity Exchange is a, is a, was founded in 2013 and is a leading um, provider of particularly uh, demand response technologies and services. So we operate and um, we manage a demand response portfolio of more than 140 megawatts in the, in the all island market and um, constituted mainly of um, flexible, um, flexible large electrical loads that can um, reduce. Uh, also backup generation on, on large industrial sites and also embedded generation such as CHP and anaerobic digestion. Um, what we specialise in doing is effectively using our advanced in-house technologies to help unlock the flexibility that's inherent in large energy users' assets and enable them to you know, participate in providing uh, services to, to the grid. Um, and our mission statement is really to enable the increased utilisation of renewables um, by developing our technologies and services that support limiting the barriers to renewable integration. Um, so that's a little bit about who Electricity Exchange are. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just, just um, before, we, um, before we shift into a kind of panel discussion and, and discussing various aspects, I'd like to just you know, set the scene with some of my perspectives, um, things that I, I believe are relevant for the discussion around you know, the role for, or potential role for embedded um, gas engine generators at data center sites, particularly in Ireland. Um, so if you can flick to the next slide. So this is something that's highly interesting to me. I just wanted to present an example from um, of a very famous uh, duck curve, which has um, originated in California, which shows the, how the kind of demand profile in, in the California market has, has been impacted 
you know, as, as the penetration of solar energy there has really um, increased significantly in recent years. What you can see is that that presents in the middle of the day when solar output is very high, it presents a kind of significant risk of overgeneration in that they're, they're, they're struggling to, you know, to keep the, the required kind of minimum volumes of conventional generation on the system and um, to provide inertia um, and, and other services that are needed. And then it presents a really big issue um, to meet the evening peak in that you've got solar ramping down just as the, you know, as the, as the demand on the grid is ramping up. So the ramping kind of requirement gets progressively more extreme. So I think that's a really good example of how, you know, power grids um, across the world are kind of being progressively driven by, um, by renewable energy penetrations. And that's, I think, really prominent here in Ireland. It isn't solar uh, for us. That's the kind of the main technology, which is kind of driving, you know, events on the grid. It's, it, for us, it's wind. You know, we've already got a lot of wind and, and it's increasing a lot. Um, so that's just a little bit kind of, yeah, I guess, an interesting comparison looking at some of the challenges that grids are facing around, around the globe. We can flick to the next slide. So if we look at then the challenge that we face in Ireland, as I said, it's, it's predominantly wind driven. So these are these three charts on the screen are just three examples of each of a two day period within the last quarter. Um, so the first one you can see um, the, um, the gray is wind and the orange is interconnector flow. <laughs> Who is the rest? So it's the kind of the residual part of demand that's not met by interconnector inflows or by by winds. So you can see this period was uh, really low wind output, um, but fairly high demand. So you can see in that case you need you know you need an alternative technology that's able to supply you know to keep the lights on and supply multi-day capacity during periods of low wind output. Um, in the middle one, then this is a particularly high wind period. So you can see the cha the biggest challenge here is overnight. Where you've got high wind on the system, low demand is actually, um, you know, keeping you know enough conventional generation at the moment on the system to provide the kind of necessary system reliability and inertia. Um, and at the moment, that's providing a ceiling on the amount of renewables we can accommodate on the grid and leading to curtailment. Um, on the right, then you can see variability. So you can see in this case there was an instance where the wind on the system was ramping down due to you know, weather uh, at the same time as the demand on the grid was ramping up to meet an evening peak. And you can see that when those two kind of compound each other together, the, the ramping required from other generators on the system to fill the gap is, uh, you know, is pretty extreme. So this drives us in a direction of saying, OK, you know, at the moment, we've got a lot of gas fired capacity on the system. I think most people acknowledge that, you know, there is a, certainly a role for, for gas fired flexible capacity on the system, at least as a bridge technology. But it's not the same gas. We're going to need gas fired capacity that can be more flexible, more responsive, can start and stop more can ramp more quickly, can stay on at lower levels of minimum minimum load. Um, OK, if you flick to the next slide. Just a, a little example of you know, what's changing on the grid here in Ireland. You can see on the left, you know, Ireland um, had the, in 2018 was, was number two for the um, amount of electricity which was generated from wind, if you include onshore and offshore. If you focus just on onshore, it was actually number one. So we're a kind of small uh, synchronous system that's effectively an island. It's pretty lightly interconnected to other markets and, and it's got an extremely high level of, of renewable generation. And I think what's interesting is that that's increasing. So we've got the climate action plan here in Ireland to decarbonize. And we've got you know, a, an impending push with the new um, renewable energy support schemes into um, offshore wind and electrification of heat and all of those things. So some really big transformations ongoing on the wider grid outside of the data center sphere. If you skip to the next slide then. Um, this is my uh, my final slide, I'd be glad to hear. So the, the island, in Ireland, we have really ambitious targets to uh, increase the penetration of renewables from 40% in 2020 up to 70% in 2030. That's gonna mean that we need to um, at the moment, we have a, have a limit. There's this metric used by Agrid um, and, and those in the electricity sector called system non-synchronous penetration, which is the maximum, effectively the maximum amount of renewables we can accommodate on the grid at any moment while still kind of meeting system security and reliability standards. At the moment, that's limited to 65 percent. So if any if in any period there's, there's more renewables than that available, they would have to be curtailed down to that level. Um, and so one of the, the key challenges to getting to 70% renewables is increasing the amount of that SNSP, uh, SNSP limit up to 95% plus within the next 10 years. How are we going to do that? You know, we'll need a lot more, um, you know, 
we'll need new providers of new services on the system, be that batteries, you know, more more uh, large energy users providing demand response services, new um, flexible, dispatchable uh, gas fire generation. You know, we'll, we need new solutions that can effectively enable this transition towards, you know, 100% renewables ultimately over the next over the next decades. So it's a, it's a massive challenge um, from the wider grid perspective. How do data centers, um, how do data centers feed into that? Um, I think, I think it's, it's key to those who, who look at, it's, it's clear to those who look at these things more often than I that data centers, you know, are gonna be massive growth. The air grid are projecting that the, the demand on the Irish grid could grow between you know, 25 and 45% in the next decade, driven by data centers. Um, and I think data centers could either compound this challenge, you know, make the challenge of decarbonizing and, and adopting 100% renewables more difficult, or they could be part of the solution if they're able to, you know, to provide some of these services. And I think embedded um, embedded generation, if it if it can be flexible and responsive and responds to the kind of right market signals to provide flexibility and, and ancillary services to the system, can definitely you know add value and contribute to reliability and, and decarbonisation. That's all I wanted to say, just to set the scene, just to give some some flavours of the type of the type of things that um, that I'm focused on uh, in this space. Thanks, John. Uh, David, David Mitchell-Tree. Hi, how are you? Uh, this is Dave Mitchell-Tree. I'm in the uh, Emerald City, Seattle, saying hello to everyone in the Emerald Isles there. I work for Yenbacher. We are the leading uh, dedicated gas engine uh, provider. We're an OEM. We have manufacturing in Europe and in North America. You can see some of the installation base there. Next slide, please. Uh, we cover a wide range of things. Uh, in the data center space, we are the only provider of a three megawatt fast start unit, but we span kind of the one megawatt to three megawatt range that could be tailored directly towards data centers. Next slide, please. So what are the, uh, the question is, is why gas generation for data centers? I mean, here's the big drivers. Uh, lower emissions, if you're going from a tier two diesel to natural gas, uh, you're going to have 20, 30% CO2 reduction, 90% NOx reduction. You can reduce the NOx a little bit further with SCR. But the big kind of interesting step forward is uh, uh, dual fuel capabilities, natural gas and hydrogen, and the future step towards 100% hydrogen engine. So bridging the gap from some sort of fossil fuel emissions to zero fossil fuel emissions with 100% hydrogen engine. Uh, it's these assets that are behind the meter. I mean, basically, they're an energy insurance policy for the data center where you can arbitrage back into the markets, either the electricity capacity or demand response like John was talking about. And uh, you monetize and reduce your OPEX with those opportunities. Next slide, please. Fast start, that was the big technologically uh, technological step forward, the ability to take on full load uh, up to three megawatts in under 45 seconds. We've tested it down to 30 seconds, but we guarantee at 45 just to be uh, prudent. And uh, you, you could do that in a linear route or you could do it with stepped increments, which is the prudent way to do it as you're taking you know, uh, your load off of the UPS, your short-term energy insurance policy in, term of, in the form of batteries so that you're not, you know, you're, you're providing nice, uh, frequency and voltage and, and overall transients, high quality power back into the data center. And the reliability of the natural gas grid, it's got, it's below ground infrastructure. Uh, you don't have the issues with above ground infrastructure like the electric world, and you've got a built in supply. Next slide, please. Uh, here's just a, a visual on the uh, emissions. Uh, uh, NOx, which is typically your limiting factor for uh, data center campuses, uh, it's 90% reduction there. The gray bar versus the green bar, we can reduce the green bar further with SCR. The CO2, the way we're going to get rid of that is going to hydrogen, and we could reduce that down to zero, no emissions with hydrogen. Next slide, please. Uh, monetization of the assets. How are you going to offset your OPEX after you spent hundreds of millions of dollars on generators uh, for your data center campus? Uh, again, you could island away or parallel depending on what your scenario is. I'm not going to go through all the details. You can look at these slides later. Next slide, please. 
Here's the fast start capabilities, uh, 45 seconds to full load uh, on par with, you know, the, the ability of like diesel to take rapid response. This is the technological step forward for gas. Um, you can do it in the increments there, the 25% increments or straight up to 100% load, 45 seconds. Next slide, please. So hydrogen, uh, Yenbacher's got a lot of experience in the hydrogen space. There's projects around the world have been going on for a while. Uh, this gives you a little bit of a sampling. Next slide, please. So here's kind of our roadmap. Uh, we can plug and play with an engine today at up to like 25% uh, hydrogen. Uh, we can increase that up to 60, 75%. Uh, we've got the ability to convert. If you buy a gas engine today, a, a natural gas engine, we can convert it up to hydrogen or uh, the ultimate step forward would be 100% hydrogen. Great, good morning folks. Um, my name is Tom Crowley, I'm the Large Industrial Commercial Sales Manager for Gas Networks Ireland. Gas Networks Ireland is part of a multi-utility infrastructure company, which is Ervia. So on one hand, we have Irish water, for wastewater and water services, and then ourselves for gas infrastructure on the other hand. And interestingly, um, we have a segment of our business, which is Aurora Telecom, that also offers dark fiber services to um, the Irish market and uh, currently serves a lot of data centers in Ireland. For me, um, I just want to share my insights as to the characteristics of the gas network that lend itself to such an important role of embedded generation. And to summarize those in three headings, I think that's reliability, flexibility, and sustainability credentials. So our core role is to deliver um, 700,000 customers a safe, reliable, affordable, clean source of fuel. While predominantly our number of connections is housing, that also includes, uh, that figure also includes 305,000, um, <coughs> 305 large industrial and commercial customers, and it includes 11 large power generators across the island of Ireland. Natural gas in Ireland accounts for nearly a third of Ireland's primary energy mix, and that's often forgotten um, because it is the silent artery um, that, that's submerged in the ground in, in Ireland. Um, it's a piece of infrastructure that's worth 2.7 billion, and we have um, one of the most modern gas networks in Europe. We generated 470 million euros in revenue, and indeed, last year we invested 110 million in capital expenditure to ensure that we continue to have an extremely reliable and efficient gas network. 52% of Ireland's electricity is powered by natural gas and currently comes from natural gas. So natural gas is still the biggest provider of electricity here in Ireland. Um, so this is not new. The, the topic from this morning um, is not a new technology and you're often quite only one step removed from natural gas fired um, generate, or electricity generation. 47% of the gas used in Ireland is coming from indigenous sources. And that's via coral gas field. And we're also increasing that with the availability of renewable gas or biomethane. And we launched our first um, commercial volumes of biomethane being injected into our network in May of this year. Our gas network has a, a huge degree of flexibility, both in terms of the amount of capacity that's available. We have customers that are consuming up, upwards of 800 megawatt thermal from our gas network at any point in time but also in terms of the flexibility in terms of its pricing mechanisms and the availability of booking short-term capacity, which facilitates large power generation at short notice. Our network spans 14, in excess of 14,000 kilometers. So it can wrap around the coastline of Ireland four times. Um, and again, it's, it's often forgotten about because it's submerged within the, um, the ground around Ireland. And that's one of the reasons that it's so resilient and it's been proven to be able to deal with the extreme cold temperatures that we experienced back in 2010 or indeed the storms that we um, experienced in 2018-2019. It's a network that's designed for a one in 15 year event or the peak demand that we could possibly experience and so it's such a again a reliable and resilient network. We have diversity in terms of 
consumption reasons for natural gas, supplying energy for power gen, heat and transport, but also diversity in terms of supply. We have two subsea interconnectors that connect us back into Scotland and the greater um, UK gas market. And you'll note that where they actually enter the um, Irish market is right adjacent to Dublin. So there's a huge amount of capacity available um, around Dublin. We also have the Corrib gas field, um, and that's last year supplied approximately 40%, 7% of the um, gas need for, for Ireland. Next slide, please. So natural gas and electricity generation is not new. And natural gas is actually enabling a significant amount of renewable electricity generation in Ireland by complementing other intermittent renewables such as solar and wind. And the graph that you're looking at is the electricity generation per month and the original source of that energy. And you can see that natural gas plays a significant part in that, which complements the other renewables um, making their way out to the grid. And you'll see the red line actually shows how flexible the gas network or gas power generation is in terms of its um, percentage of the overall electricity generation. And if you were to enter into each individual day and each individual hour within those periods, you will see electricity generation from natural gas actually constitutes upwards up to 90% of our electricity has been coming from natural gas. So that flexibility is so, so important in terms of enabling um, the, the renewables onto the grid. Interestingly, to put it in context, 57% of our throughput or our consumption of natural gas relates to power generation. So again, this is not new. And I ask you to challenge your way of thinking to consider the applications and benefits of a natural gas um, embedded generation, whether that's for backup, bridging a power constraint, complementing flexible grid offers, primary power, and the benefits including offset and peak import cost times, benefit from grid service payments, increase your diversity and reliability um, and increase your diversity and reliability of access to renewable energy sources and, and indeed it has been proven and accepted that on-site generation or embedded generation can meet the five nines in an overall data center design. Next slide please. So the natural gas network has is already enabling a significant amount of um, renewables onto the network, and it's going to continue to do so. It's going to continue to play an important role in the electricity network, but also in the wider market through compressed natural gas vehicles, and initially that will be via biomethane, but equally that ultimately the goal is um, to, to be biomethane, apologies. Renewable gas, I mentioned that we have launched our first um, injection point for biomethane, which is a completely renewable indigenous source of fuel and we have established a certification um, scheme here in Ireland which allows you to um, purchase the renewable gas from developers here in Ireland. Carbon capture and storage, we're also assessing the potential for carbon capture and storage um, in Ireland and indeed hydrogen is also going to be a game changer in the future and whether that's a blend of hydrogen in the gas network or dedicated network um, we're exploring that currently so it's an exciting time here in the the energy market and also the um, gas market um, and if you want to explore the benefits that that can offer you i ask you to come and, and come and talk to us and with that i'll hand you over to john thank you sean hey, john. Thank you, Ed. Um, so Clark Energy um, sort of ties all this together. What, 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 our, what our role is, is to tie all, all of this together. We are the, um, we are the, the distributor, distributor and service provider for Yambacher gas engines in 27 countries around the world. And our mission is really to um, aspire to anti-climax when it comes to installing um, gas engines into an embedded uh, scenario. Uh, embedded being somewhere out on the grid, either embedded in a data center or embedded in the um, embedded in the network itself. Um, uh, and and I, I think as Sean has demonstrated quite 
quite well. In Ireland, we have an abundance of gas and a reliability of gas as a fuel that can be used in those embedded scenarios. Um, next slide, please. Clark Energy's focus is to, to uh, engineer, install and maintain these solutions such that we can, that they will, they will become um, uh, part, of the, part of the everyday um, energy, energy production for the, for the data center. And we have a range of things, skills, uh, an inventory of skills, parts, engineering capability, um, design capability, and obviously maintenance capability as well. Next slide, please. Uh, we focus on taking the, the INEO uh, gas engine that David has described and uh, installing that into the specific application, the customer, the customer's project, whether that be a, a hospital, whether it be a peaking plant, or whether it be a, uh, a, 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 an energy centre for, for uh, soft drink production. Next slide, please. Um, this is a project that I think is worthy to talk about. It was a, a very complex project. It's 15 megawatts of uh, electrical output. It's, it was the first quad gen plant and the tower that you see, um, it's a 35 meter tall uh, contactor tower that is used for stripping CO2 out of um, the exhaust stream from the gas engine. And in this case, that CO2 was stripped as food grade CO2 that could be used in, in other locations. <coughs> This plant produced steam, electricity, chilled water, and obviously carbon dioxide for that. And it was, uh, it was completely designed uh, and fabricated by, by Clark Energy. Next slide, please. And this plant is a 50 megawatt or it's just under 50 megawatt uh, peaking plant that has been built close to a, a, a network node, an electrical network node, as you can see in the background there. And the idea of this plant is, is it comes it comes on and produces that flexible capacity that John Sedgwick had, had described earlier on. It's 50 megawatts uh, comprised of 11 engines, which gives us flexibility from two megawatts to 50 megawatts at, you know, um, 40, 40, 42% electrical efficiency, primary energy electrical efficiency. So we have a range of skills and, in, and, and an inventory of, of a of abilities that will that help to integrate these projects and make these projects part of the everyday for data centers users and indeed any any other industrial users. Thanks, Ed. All right, John. Um, thanks very much for the introduction. So um, it occurs to me that we're going to have a number of um, data center specialists on this call that are not embedded generation specialists. Okay, so I'd like to go right back to basics now and ask you something very fundamental. Why the heck do we need embedded generation when we've got diesel generators? John? Curly, for example? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think the thing, Ed, is that um, the, the, I've been around the data center business quite a long time. And, and, and in fact, Sean and I have probably been evangelizing on the benefits of gas engines for quite a long time, probably more years than either of us care to remember. Um, I, I think the, the the concept of the diesel engine in the data center has been to provide that 2N capability. So if N is the demand of the data center, the electrical demand of the data center, one N comes from the grid connection and the second N comes from the, the diesel engines. And in fact, that standby system, as you, you're well aware, is both the diesel engine and the UPS that typically the, the, uh, the, the, the diesel engine supplies through. The challenge, as John Sedgwick has, has laid out for us here, is that particularly in Ireland where we have, you know, a, an SNSP that is probably world leading. Um, I think that, you know, without a doubt, I think most people would agree we have a, we have a very much an islanded electrical system with a small amount of, of interconnection or a relatively small amount of interconnection. And therefore, the power flows in Ireland become quite interesting, particularly given that we have an equivalent amount of onshore wind connected at the moment that is equal to the to the to the system demand. The 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 idea is is that that two n challenge for the data center that they've always they've had the they've had the benefit of for many years is going to change. They will still probably have their diesel engines, but the 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 
the grid situation or the electrical situation at the grid is going to is going to change. That energy um, that energy uh, equation is going to become, or the energy equilibrium maybe is a better way of putting it, is going to become a little bit more um, imbalanced. And as part of that, you know, there's a drive towards you know solving that problem with gas engines, which can run for longer periods of time with less emissions and so on like that. So there's this there's this dichotomy really where I think you will still be left with one end coming from standby gases and diesels and one end coming from a combination of the traditional electrical grid and embedded generation. Okay, so what if I told you there's a data center we're looking at at the moment, which is about 100 megawatts of IT, and we are planning to design it with gas engines and the utility supporting? What would you say? I'd be, I'd be delighted to talk to you about that. You know, I, I uh, that would be that would be music to music to my ears. Um, I, I think that the the challenge I think comes is uh, integrating that into the traditional design of the data center. You know, the the, the data centers and and I'm not an expert on this, Ed. So you know, I, I look for your guidance in that way. But you know, the, the whole concept of sort of 100% redundancy, the idea of having um, capabilities, you know, the, the amber bus, the, the blue bus, the, 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 you know, redundant servers, rooms, the, all of that type of electrical infrastructure that gets, gets duplicated and replicated around is going to have to modify a little bit because you're going to see, um, you know, the changes that will come from having 100 megawatts of on-site generation will be significant. I think the other part of that, and you and I have spoken about this at length, is that you know we we are also going to see, I I think, a greater amount of storage as well. I think you're going to see a gas engine and storage solution, which that storage may come in the form of you know excess or curtailed wind generating hydrogen, or indeed um, electrical storage where the the electricity is already available and stored in you know battery energy storage systems and so on like that. But uh, I think that you're going to see a, a hybrid mix of electrical storage, potentially gas storage in the form of hydrogen, and 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 that may be mass storage in the form of that that hydrogen being delivered into the grid and then distributed out from the grid, or indeed local storage on a on a particular site. But that does raise some more challenges in that way. I think though one of the challenges at the moment is the mindset. The mindset of the of data center of the data center community, I, I think, is you know we're in the data business. We take electricity, we turn that into pushing electrons around the globe to serve you know Gangnam style video downloads or whatever whatever that is, whatever the data demand happens to be at, at a particular time. And 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 the, the challenge of that is is that it's it's quite a binary. You know, there's an input of electricity, there's an output of data flowing. And, and that, that paradigm, I think, is going to shift or is shifting. In fact, I think it has already shifted in reality. It's the, and, and the challenge is going to be that there's going to be a little bit, the, the input side is going to be a little bit more complex. Thanks, John. Hey, I, could I add in? I, 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 I was just going to ask you a question, David, if, if, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to, if I could finish up a response to that last mm. bit, I mean, Another thing to consider is, is that the permitting of diesels becoming more challenging in different markets. You've had hyperscalers say that they're going to go diesel free by 2030. And you've also seen some regulation with the uh, permitting councils in Ireland for greater efficiency with like district heating. So they're looking for a more elegant solution than diesel and gas is a path to that direction. So sorry, go ahead, Ed. Well, that was the question I was going to ask oh. you, basically, right? So, but but I'll, I'll, I'll frame it slightly. No, people might think otherwise. So I'll frame it exactly sure. the way it was going to frame it. So just because, again, you've got to understand the way data center people think, okay? We're a very conservative, reserved yeah. community. Dear old friend of mine used to say, still says, data center industry loves innovation as long as it's 20 years old, okay? Yeah, it's like the utility so, world. <laughs> right, right. So... But you, you've got you've got a you've got a background not only in gas engines but also from an end user point of view. And I know that you're connected to the end users, the hyperscalers, and so on. Are they driving demand for gas? Engine? Yes, uh, we, we've had the opportunity to install the first hyperscale data center uh, in the world. It's in North America using the three <laughs> megawatt fast start natural gas engines from Yenbacher. So. 
Uh, we've got a track record there. We'd like to extend it out to Europe and help out with the solutions in Ireland because uh, data centers are a huge part of the export economy. Uh, Ireland has done very well. They've punched above their weight. They're the uh, European success story in data centers, and you're going to see some growth there. You know, upwards of maybe two gigawatts is in the pipeline uh, for energy use for Ireland related to data centers. So uh, the biggest emission source for data centers are diesel gens in terms of the, the OPEX after you've laid the uh, concrete and put in the steel. So gas engines give you a path towards, you know, hydrogen, where you can be carbon free going forward. All right, thanks. David, sure. um, I want to turn to John now. And John Sedgwick, that is. Um, so uh, it's on a kind of a slightly technical subject, but I think we need to sort of just uh, spend a minute on this, on this, this S SNSP term and, and what that really means um, and, and, and what that means in the context of gas generation. So uh, system non synchronous penetration. John, you know all about that more than most. Um, can we talk about that a bit, please? And can we also talk about um, this concept of, of, of monitoring the grid and grid stability? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Effectively, we're, we're, trans, we're in the process of a transition from a, a power grid that was dominated by you know, conventional generation technologies, big, large power stations with um, synchronous generators and providing massive amounts of spinning inertia to the to the grid as a kind of almost as a byproduct. We're transitioning to a um, a power system that's dominated by distributed technologies, and um, a lot of which are connected to the grid. You know, through uh, through inverters, power you know, power converters, wind turbines, and solar PV. You know, they're they're not providing the same kind of synchronous inertia as a as a large conventional power station provides, and that's a real challenge to integrate into the system. It means that if there is a fault on the system, you know, the system has less kind of inherent inertia and stability to be able to kind of ride through that fault. So you need then to put in place a lot of other measures to, to manage the system, to keep it stable, to keep it reliable, to keep it resilient to faults, even with, you know, these, these massive penetrations of, of renewables and non-synchronous generation. Um, so that's the challenge that, you know, that we're facing. And AirGrid, I think, is really, you know, leading the world in, in, in dealing with that problem in, you know, designing and upgrading a system that's able to operate with, you know, lower and lower uh, amounts of kind of conventional large, uh, large transmission connected generation plant um, on the bars at any given time. Um, yep. So that's a little bit of, of yeah, perhaps extra flavor on, you know, why SNSP is a, is a challenge and a, and a really relevant metric. Yeah, so I, I was looking through participants earlier and I know there's a lot of people outside of Ireland listen to this call as well from all our territories and countries so I guess the, the point we're trying to make here overall is in the context of um, SNSP uh, if specifically you know David talked earlier about solar we have a comparable problem with wind with a different type of time constant but a comparable problem so from a data center perspective, the weird thing, I'm not lecturing, I'm trying to lead into this next point here, which is the next point, is the data center now moves from being, from a jet, from a generation, from a standby generation point of view, it now becomes a generator instead of being a, 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 a net cost to the data center, effectively becomes an asset to the data center. This is the, this is the main thing. Let, but Sean, before I come to you, I just want to swim back to either uh, John or David to respond to that, please. Either one. John Clark or David. The, so, so uh, uh, I'm sorry, David, do you, do you want to go ahead? I think you're on mute, David. Yeah, sure. Uh, so the question was, is uh, how do you monetize this energy insurance policy that's behind the meter? Um, again, it's arbitrage back into the energy or the capacity or demand response. Uh, any of those paths can offset your OPEX cost. And again, it's, you know, if you're installing a bunch of diesel gens that you can't uh, utilize because you're hamstrung by the emissions requirements in whatever scenario you're involved with, uh, going with gas gives you longer run hours, the ability to arbitrage and have less emissions and benefit back into the grid like we've heard about uh, before here from John in terms of there's a huge amount of renewables uh, going on it, going in on in 
in and offshore in Ireland. So that's going to be a challenge to balance some of the intermittency that comes along with that. And that's where these behind the meter assets can be a contributor and participant in the electric system. I, I, I think the other the other element of that as well, Ed, is is just the, the ability to arbitrage gas, you know, the cost of gas into the cost of electricity. So, you know, in, in moving from it being a a cost center, it has the potential to become a revenue center. And indeed, as as John Sedgwick will, will probably talk to it more eloquently than I can, um, there, we have 14 what we call system services here related to um, D, DS3, which is, the, which is the policy document in relation to developing a sustainable, secure uh, electricity system. And, and each of those, each of those have um, have a revenue stream associated with them, you know, which is incremental revenue to a to a to an energy center. But you know, depending on the design and depending on the capability, the the way in which a a twenty megawatt, a thirty megawatt, you know, a ten megawatt data center was was operational and was integrated, um, it could it could very well harvest some of the some of those revenues. John, you might like to say some more to that. Yeah, for sure. As we, you know, I think I think the key for me is that if if we build the right type of embedded uh, generation technologies at data center sites, it can really act as a as an enabler for renewables. At, at the moment, if you know if if the grid needs to keep on, say three, you know, three large conventional combined cycle gas turbine power plants all the time to to stay reliable to maintain the required reliability, that's going to act as a ceiling on renewables, and we're going to have to curtail renewables down, which is, you know, going to hamper our transition to to the renewable and decarbonisation targets we've committed to. So oh, I think maybe the government will start paying us to build data centres then. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe that'd be nice. But I think the um, you know if we can build the right good triad, very good triad. <laughs> we can build the right type of. You know, flexible generation assets, and we can op ensure that they operate in the market in the in the optimum way in terms of you know responding to to pro to the right price signals. And, and John hit on that with DS3. You know, as the as the market transitions, you know, Agrid recognise that there's you know they need to put in place the right market mechanisms to reward the type of flexibility and the different services which they need to procure to keep the system reliable. So you know, in particular, that's that's. There's a really high value in fast acting response services that can, you know, respond, you know, really quickly within 150 milliseconds of a of a fault event on the grid, and you know, in order to, to catch it and keep it stable and return it to nominal frequency. And those, those are exactly the type of, you know, grid monitoring and fast acting response services that um, companies like Electricity Exchange are specialised in providing. Yeah, so hopefully we'll have a chance to get back to that one because that's an that's an interesting point. Is the automation side of bringing embedded generation online and so on? Um, but I mean, clearly, what you're outlining here, I think, is is a confluence or rather a coincidence of requirements and requirements of the grid itself and requirements of the data center industry, and 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 then and and therefore it does It's not a big leap of thinking to say, well. It's, Gas generation, if not gas generation, what is going to plug this synchronous gap? What will? And, and is there anything else? I, I, I don't think so. Uh, that, that perhaps is rhetorical. Sean, could I turn to you for a minute? Um, Sean? Yeah. Are you there? Hi. Um, just just a couple of, a couple of things. Um, what sort of level of demand are you seeing from in gas consumption point of view from the data center industry at the moment? That's, that's one question. And I could ask you a second one to go with that. Uh, how will the network um, ramp up in the short to medium term, let's say in the next sort of five to 10 years to meet data center demand um, uh, and time to market? Perfect. Um, so from a data center demand, we're seeing a significant um, level of interest and demand from data centers. And ultimately that, that varies according to the entity that we're dealing with. So whether it's for an interim or temporary um, um, supply to um, complement constrained um, areas in the grid or to complement flexible grid power offers or indeed to act as primary or backup. Um, and, and just to pick up on something that was talked about a little bit earlier, I suppose that, you know, a lot of our data center um, companies here in Ireland have ambitions to get to a carbon neutral 2030 place. Diesel won't, won't get us there. 
and diesel won't get the customers there. So they're looking to natural gas to provide that access to renewable sources uh, by biomethane in the shorter term and the longer term to hydrogen to, to satisfy that requirement. And I suppose the, the, the demand we're seeing, Ed, is to, to really leverage the reliability, but also the abundant capacity that's available from our network. Um, and especially in around the Dublin uh, region, it's a, it's a very exciting time in the, the energy um, space, but also in the gas network, you know, making um, biomethane available um, and injecting it onto the network, you know, is gathering a huge amount of interest um, and um, success, I suppose, in terms of attracting additional um, customers here um, in Ireland. In terms of the, the other question you raised, how will GNI or gas start to ramp up to meet data center demand? Like now in 2027, gas demand is expected to rise by approximately 23%. And that's on foot of um, you know, Ireland making a conscious decision to get away from um, peak generation, for instance, and coal generation, but also because of the additional demand that's going to be there for electricity. And that's predominantly data center and sector driving a lot of that requirement. Um, ultimately, how do we, as a, a network operator, a prudent network operator, react to that and ensure that we have a sufficient um, network capacity? We conduct an annual review of our system um, in what is called our network development plan, and that's a 10-year um, look into the future to ensure that we are always going to have sufficient capacity in our network, and then we, on foot of that, we make the correct investment levels um, as part of our capital expenditure plan there to ensure that we continue to have an extremely reliable um, and safe network for, for all of our customers. Very good. Um, so we've, we've talked a lot about gas. Um, we haven't talked about hydrogen. Um, gas is great, relatively speaking. It's 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 lower from the from the a greenhouse gas emissions factor perspective clearly than diesel. Although I don't see it as a like for like comparison with diesel personally. But 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 um, where are we going with hydrogen? Uh, uh, Sean, I know you're in some early stages of planning. I don't know how much uh, G and I can share. Um, but hydrogen takes us carbon neutral. So what are your thoughts? Yes, certainly. Look, G Gas Network Ireland is on a path to decarbonize the gas network. Um, on the prompt or, you know, on the short term, biomethane, for instance, we've we significant ambitions for biomethane um, to get up to 20% of our throughput um, to be biomethane. In the medium to long term, certainly hydrogen will play a significant role. Um, as an entity, you know, we've been around since 1976 as, as a gas um, transporter and our history started, you know, with city gas projects and we actually transported up to 60% of hydrogen at that stage. So th it's not a new phenomenon to say that we're currently in the process of assessing the suitability of our network to transport either a blend and ascertain what that percentage may look like um, and then equally in, in longer term what does it look like in terms of you know do we need dedicated parts of our network but ultimately you know the, the the intent is there that you know we will invest as we have previously to ensure that we have a future-proofed decarbonized network in the yeah, shorter yeah, okay. term so, so, so essentially what you're saying is first step let's get let's get things Let's get things moving with gas, but the logical next step is hydrogen. Let me talk, uh, turn to David a minute. David, where are you with hydrogen engines? Well, uh, great question because we are uh, in the middle of testing a 100% hydrogen engine in Germany right now. You know, Germany is putting uh, hydrogen into the gas grid, as Sean is talking about, up to maybe 30% in certain areas. So mm -hmm. in the changing role of the EU missions uh, requirements with the EU Commission, uh, requirements. Uh, we've done the testing on the 100% hydrogen engine. So um, yeah, uh, we've been in that role and we're looking at dedicated uh, engines going from port injection with the fast start to more direct injection, which would be a dedicated 100% hydrogen engine for the future. Okay. 
I, th- All right, I think so- one of the things one of the things to add to that, Ed, is is that you know the 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 capability to combust the hydrogen has has existed for some time. You know, it's been used as rocket fuel. It's various things like that. You know, I I, I remember some some nearly forty years ago now being involved in a in a project with the refinery in down in Whitegate in Cork where they they were going to use excess hydrogen to power. Um, uh, an embedded um, engine down there, and then somebody came up with the the idea of using hydrogen cracking in uh, in refining technology, which meant that hydrogen had a much gr- greater value in the refining process than it had in the energy production process. The, the point I think is going to be is is that there's there's quite a complex infrastructure, national infrastructure change required for hydrogen. The hydrogen is going to have to be produced somewhere. Um, you know, the obvious thing in Ireland to do is to is to use excess renewable electricity um, to, and feed that into to electrolyzers. That are is the is one of the one of the methodologies of making of making hydrogen. And you know, whereas the the transportation of hydrogen is is important, the where that hydrogen is going to come from is is equally important and is. Uh, you know, we we don't want to create an expectation that that's going to happen overnight. That is going to be a journey for us. Um, the point is, though, that your gas engine, if you if you have a, a gas engine system installed, that gas engine system, that investment is somewhat free, future proofed by the fact that it can it can ultimately take a proportion of hydrogen as the as that hydrogen infrastructure develops, or a or or a complete you know 100% hydrogen. Um, in, in the future as well. Uh, so I think that's very important, you know, and I think that, you know, the journey that it is a journey, you know, we're, we're going to move from, you know, through, uh, biomethane as well. And, you know, um, G and I have done a great job in developing, you know, the first of the injection points, there's more injection points going to come, you know, the separation of, um, the production of bio of biogas and then the separation of the CO2 from that gas, because it's pre- predominantly a CO2 molecule and a, 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 a methane molecule, the separation of that CO2, and then the transportation of that. That's a proven technology now. It's, it's, uh, it's a question of just having that infrastructure to make the biogas um, on, a, on a scale that is, uh, is, um, is, moves, the, moves, the, moves the dial in the direction of, re, of, re, of renewable gas. So one of the problems we always have wherever we're working um, in data center design is is fuel storage and fire prevention, fire suppression. Mm-hmm. I remember as a kid, now I'm no hydrogen person as you're about to find out, but doing my chemistry lesson and having little one of those kind of, you know, and I put it in a test tube and it's gonna, as opposed to diesel, which you can pretty much throw a cigarette into and it's not gonna do anything. So my point is there is this, there is this inherent perhaps naive fear um, for people that haven't used hydrogen, including myself, about the volatility and the safety of, of, of uh, hyd- one hydrogen storage and two hydrogen usage. And I guess, Sean, this is obviously something that Jay and I have thought through more so than anyone. I mean, what can you tell us about uh, that, that element of things, hydrogen safety? And, 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 and I should, be, should, I, should we be thinking gas hydrogen blend or should we be thinking transition ultimately to hydrogen from natural gas? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Well, the, the engines can be dual fuel and, and a path towards 100% hydrogen. Okay, but Sean, any, any thoughts on this, whether we're going to stay blend, we'll go to full hydrogen? I mean, I know that you may not be able to answer that, but I'll ask you anyway. Yeah, certainly. I, I think it's something that we're assessing currently in terms of, you know, do, does it look like a blend or does it look like a dedicated network, for instance? And, or, you know, are we have two different types gas network in Ireland, we have a high pressure steel pipeline, um, which doesn't necessarily lend itself to, to hydrogen, whereas our polyethylene or distribution network, which would make up the vast majority, may lend itself to, to um, dedicated hydrogen use, you know, so that's that's something that we're assessing currently um, in terms of safety. Look, safety is paramount for GNI, um, and we invest heavily in terms of protecting the infrastructure that we, we operate. Um, and I, I guess, you know, on foot of the, the cold periods and the storms that you've 
seen, you know, there, there's, there's good reason that you don't hear us on the news afterwards or making announcements. Um, it's because we are inherently good at protecting infrastructure and ensuring the safety of, um, of all of our customers and wider, wider market. Okay. I want to come back to John uh, Sedgwick. John, let's talk a little bit more about the commercial side of this because, uh, you know, we talked a bit about the technical side and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> if you were somebody listening to this and maybe a commercial person, a senior manager, decision maker, and you've got uh, a situation where either your investment portfolio includes or you are a data center owner or operator and you're considering gas generation, and I'm, I'm talking in a, in, a, in a very broad context now, what are the sort of things, what are the sort of benefits that people should take, that, 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 that the decision makers and, and pros and cons that the decision makers need to take into account? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll focus on as a, as a kind of, as a non data center specialist, I'll focus on the kind of the, the, the business, the kind of system facing business case of, of that embedded generation asset. So not focusing on the uh, resilience benefit and the N plus two and Fair enough. Yeah. 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 So, you know, an embedded, an embedded uh, generation asset, like a yeah, based on gas engines, a co-located as data center site. In Ireland, we have a what's called a capacity market, which um, you know where generation capacity, like such an asset, can benefit from a kind of fixed revenue stream across the year for providing huh. and making its capacity available to the market. That's a kind of key revenue stream for such an asset. The other revenue stream we already touched on is uh, D DS3 services. So these are ancillary services which are procured by AgRid in addition to, you know, the kind of market for energy, which which they procure to help them to, to balance the system and, and to manage the system and keep it within its uh, defined limits. So I mentioned some of these earlier. Some of these are around in inertia. Some of them are around reactive power and some of them are predominantly around providing the kind of fast acting uh, response that can, you know, can... Uh, can help AirGrid to manage the system in the event of any any faults, such as a large power plant and an interconnector uh, tripping. Um, the other, I think, key revenue stream is you know is is like John mentioned is in terms of arbitrage. You know, as we as we move into a world where we've got you know really high penetrations of renewables, we're likely to see periods where the the market price for electricity is low or even negative, where we have a surplus of renewables. And on the flip side, we're we're going to see periods of you know high pricing where you know there's a scarcity pricing. Uh, situation to to reflect the kind of true value to the system of generation capacity during those periods where there isn't um, surplus renewable capacity. Um, so I think if we can if we can have um, embedded generation assets that are really you know designed and op op their business cases optimized around responding to all of those things, maximizing the the you know, the, the um, provision to the to the market of the inherent flexibility and capacity they have to provide those services and to respond to those signals i think you know there's a there's an attractive business case there and we're already seeing that if you look in the um, if you look in the capacity options it, over the last few years you know we're seeing um flexible gas engine based and um, power generation capacity start to start to clear in those options ahead of large um, combined cycle gas turbine plants so there, there are a number of um, there are a number of yeah kind of more flexible um, gas turbine and gas engine based uh, plants which are which are starting to be built. Some of which are co-located at data centres. Some of which are standalone. And um, for example, based at a, the the site of a large former power plant. Right. One other that, thing okay. uh, that yes, sure, add sure. to that. I suppose is that you know the 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 cost of the input fuel and um, like. Ireland is connected to one of the most liquid markets um, in Europe via the UK. Like currently, you can purchase gas for next summer at around 32 pence per turn, which is around you know 1.2 cent per kilowatt hour. Now, granted, you have to pay transportation costs, but it is extremely um, keen in terms of purchasing um, the cost of of natural gas, um, and that makes it um, extremely. Uh, you know, efficient and commercially viable to, to start offsetting, you know, peaks um, in the um, in electricity prices. Hey, so, Sean, question for you. I may not be able to answer this one because it's a tricky one. You've got a lot of international listeners on this call. That's very low. That's a very low cost per kilowatt hour. When, what, how high would the kilowatt hour cost need to creep up before you think it becomes a bit of an issue? 
I know, for example, in Singapore, I know, for example, in Singapore, relatively speaking, the cost of gas compared to, say, the cost of gas in Ireland is vastly different. So it's one of those influencing factors, because when you're looking at the overall equation, on the one hand, you've got this, you know, this very, very compelling argument from an SNSP point of view, from an emissions point of view, from a fuel mix point of view and so on. But one part of the equation is the cost of gas. So, so where do you think? You know, do you, or do you have a view on that? I mean, it's a bit of an, I've been asking this before, so I don't know if you've got to answer it. What, what do you think? I, I'll try my best. Um, so this, this comes back to, I suppose, comparing the cost of your landed electricity cost versus potentially what it would cost you to generate electricity on site using natural gas, for instance. Um, and normally we refer to what is the spark gap, you know, what's the difference between the cost of the fuel input that you need to generate electricity on site versus the cost of, you know, receiving it through the, the cables. Like, to give you an example, you know, at, at you know, if you were landed gas costs at two cents per kilowatt hour, um, and you assume a, a forty percent electrical efficiency, that that that's actually costing you five cents per kilowatt hour to generate electricity on site, versus depending on what kind of contract you have for your electricity and supply. You know that that could look like a landed average cost of eight or nine cent per kilowatt hour potentially but within that you're also going to have peak period times in your pricing so there's going to be a significantly higher um, spark gap as we might call it and um, that you can potentially save even more money on all right john uh, cedric want to come back to you in terms of um the use of embedded gas generation. So from AirGrid's point of view, okay, if you're AirGrid, what do they predominantly need this for? Is it for fast frequency response? Is it for base load? Is it for, you know, into, you know what I'm getting at? Is it, what, 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 what's, what's, what's the main, the, the main driver from AirGrid's perspective? Um, I, I can't, you know, obviously speak on AirGrid's behalf, but I can share my own perspective for what- Try, what go I, on, give it a go. What I think is the, the most important. I'm just conscious this is recorded, so I don't want to, uh, don't want to speak <laughs> up. Speak up. Um, <laughs> All the lawyers. Um, yeah. Um, so I think I think the, the role that flexible gas-fired generation capacity embedded at, at data center sites can provide, I think the, the primary value is, is not in the kind of really fast frequency response services. I think, you know, those services are really, that there are other assets like batteries and demand response, which I think are much better optimized to provide those really quick kind of sub 30 second responses. Um, and, and at the other end of this perspective, I don't think it's base load. Um, you know, I think if you, I think we need to move away from a world where we've got gas running base load, but if you did need it base load, a CCGT with a you know 60% efficiency or approaching that, I think would be the technology you'd be looking for. So I think, I think it's in the middle. I think it's, it's fast start. It's, it's, you know, more, multi-start it's ramping it's that kind of flexible capacity in the middle that can respond within you know as, as david said 45 seconds and potentially run for you know hours or even you know a few days um in in, in an extreme case i think you know when you look at the the charts i presented earlier looking at those two-day windows particularly the low wind one you know you can imagine batteries are a brilliant technology to you know to dig, dig you out from gaps that's minutes long even into hours but I think, you know, we're not going to build lithium ion based battery schemes that are going to, you know, plug a gap in the grid for two days and the, the cost would be really prohibitive. So I, that's the kind of primary role I see for this type of You capacity. need to talk to Antonio at ABP. <laughs> Have a chat with him. Go on. Yeah. But you're right. Of course, you're right. Yeah. The only other thing I'd like to add in terms of from AgriS perspective um, is that, you know, if, if you recognize that there's a role for this kind of flexible gas fired generation to technologies and um, you know particularly if we're able to decarbonize it with blended gas and then a, a kind of longer term view to hydrogen i think if you accept that you know i think there's a really strong argument to exploit the synergy in terms of co-locating that capacity with data centers right you know at the moment air grid are really struggling to you know with massive grid reinforcement grid upgrades needed and um, not only to facilitate data centers in and around dublin but to you know facilitate offshore wind connections to facilitate you know onshore wind connections where there's lots of wind out west you know in weaker areas of the distribution grid so i think there's actually a really strong synergy there in terms of you know reducing grid upgrade infrastructure requirements on, on that side okay all right let's just come back to the um, hydrogen um, gas blend thing 
issue here. Um, so, Sean, what percentage blend are you looking at in terms of H2? Or can't you say? I don't know. Not as of yet, I suppose it, we're, we're currently assessing it, um, Ed, um, you know, whether it's a blend, what, what level of blend may be um, appropriate, or would you have individual parts of dedicated network serving hydrogen? Um, so that's all under assessment currently. Um, so it's, so, all right. Okay, understood. And, and I probably, I, you, you did say to me that this was still in development. So. But obviously, for every percent hydrogen we add, we incrementally increase the efficiency of the machine, correct, David? Depends. Uh, I think we're probably going to be about the same overall efficiency in the end game. Um, some other alternatives to running it through the pipeline is storing on site in the form of ammonia or methanol, taking your green hydrogen, and that's, uh, uh, that's another solution you could consider. Uh, there's a huge amount of potential storage uh, capability in terms of the energy with something like uh, ammonia on site. So that, that would be another consideration. So you have your electrolyzer at the base of your wind turbine trickling off some hydrogen when you've got the uh, uh, economics that are favorable to do such, and then you store it on site in either you know hydrogen or you could convert that into something like um, ammonia and have another storage solution. Presumably, so, that, would, that, would that. Mean, presumably that would mean then that whereas at the moment data centers are typically zoned light industrial wherever they are um mm -hmm. they would now go to heavy industrial areas right i don't know what the zoning would be uh there in ireland but no, well, I'm a... very broadly speaking very broadly oh. speaking i mean data centers at the moment are, t are typically not located in residential they're typically located in in in, in low intensity uh, industrial but if you're going to start storing ammonia that's, yeah. going to, that's going to be a game changer in terms of zoning. But yeah, I, I think the way that the, 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 the challenge there is that, you know, where do you locate those pieces of infrastructure? You know, the, yeah. one of the things that we've seen with the data center, many data centers, and, and particularly in Ireland has been quite popular, is the, is the rise of the corporate PPA. The, the idea of buying, you know, output from, for, for example, a wind farm that has come off what was the refit tariff here in Ireland, where that that subsidy has ended and you know what you do with that wind farm output that wind farm output is 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 purchased by a data center as part of their energy mix i think that you know if you think you know if you think about it from an end you know efficiency of the deployment of infrastructure you know to locate um electrolyzers making hydrogen close to the wind farm that's going to have a surplus of electricity and then to maybe store that there and potentially even to locate, if you've already got a corporate PPA with that wind farm, to, to produce hydrogen when there's excess wind and then to, to use the connection when there's no wind blowing to feed electricity in is a, is a possibility as well. There's, there's a range of choices here in relation to the infrastructure. And I know Sean is probably, um, Sean is probably breaking out in a cold sweat as I talk about that that type of arrangement but i think that the the challenge will be you know the the complexity of building a data center and permitting a data center and that is is quite complex already and you know what what could happen is is that you could try to superimpose on that i think in current locations probably storage of um storage of of additional storage of fuel on the site may cha may change but storage of some of the fuel on site is already a, a a feature of a data center. So, you know, hopefully that wouldn't change that permitting too greatly. Right, okay. Um, right, so well, obviously we, we're past the hour now. Um, I'm gonna just go through one or two questions. If you guys are okay for a few more minutes, if that's all right with you. Certainly good for me, yes. All right, um, so let's see, there's a load here. And I'll try to ask some of them along the way. Um, so question, I think we've covered this, but I'd like to just go over it again. And this is really an in your question. Can I buy a hydrogen only engine today or hydrogen natural gas blend at least? Yes and yes. So we have engines that'll do the blend right now, stock off the shelf. Next year, we can deliver you a 100% hydrogen engine. Again, if you want to make an order in January, we can uh, crank that out by year end. That's the game plan. Okay. 
Um, now we covered this one as well, but I'd like to recover it. It's what are the implications of using hydrogen as an energy storage and transmission medium? Now, if this comes from a data center person, they'll be thinking similarly to me, which is going to be safety. It's not going to be about cost and efficiency. I think it's going to be safety. But 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 answer this as you will, or whoever would like to pick that one up. Yeah, I, I suppose from a uh, transmission and distribution system operator's perspective, you know, any assessment that we'd be carrying out will, will certainly um, take into consideration the safety elements of it. As I mentioned earlier on, it's paramount for Gas Network Ireland to maintain the safety ultimately of our customers and the, the wider network um, in terms of transporting any source of fuel. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think that would be addressed as, as part of that. In addition, we, we also are regulated by the Commission for Regulation of Utilities and we have a safety case approved by the, the CRU um, and that would need to be updated in, in lieu of adding any other source of fuel. So look, that would likely possibly go to public consultation then as well, you know, so that would certainly be um, a, a very considered uh, element to any decision to to introduce additional fuels into the network. And I, okay. I, I, I think the point the point is that is that, you know, the the, the expertise, you know, of, of GNI and 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 um, that that Ervia, you know, that whole organization is is really geared up to the safe delivery of Whatever the utility is flowing in in the in the in the pipeline as such, and in in that way, you know, all, all of these things are well understood by the energy industry. All of these things are well understood. They're they're probably a little bit more challenging for data center that's used to servers and and bits and bytes and so. Well, we're like used that. to we're used to diesel. This is the thing, John. I mean, yeah. this is the point yeah. again for the audience, uh, the, the the audience to understand one of the purposes of this panel is for you guys to gain some confidence that these this these technologies yes they're always evolving but this the, the, the gas engine technology is not new it's tried and tested it's been around a long long time and it simply is uh, just a fact of life specifically especially in Ireland but also in many other places um the gas generation is the argument for gas generation on site embedded gas generation is compelling um, but the, the problem you're going to have with the data center engineers is answering all of those questions. Planning, right, what's what's the zoning requirement? If you're talking about methane, hydrogen, stuff like that, I, I'm, it's rhetorical. I know what the answer to that question is. Yeah. Right? I know. Um, we, already, we, we have enough trouble with fire departments just storing diesel. Um, you can only imagine what their reservation is going to be when we start talking about uh, other um uh, other, 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 other fuels with a high calorific value. Yeah, it's, it's really which, which I guess speaks to the fact that, you know, Sean is here, you know, the, the idea of using the existing infrastructure and, and passing that to it. So potentially reducing the, the, the quantity of fuel that you need to store on site, or at least not changing the current arrangement. Because I go back to that, that 2N scenario. You know, what we are talking about here is is that you will still, the data center, I believe, will still want to have that 2 end functionality. The, the bit that is probably not going to change in the short term is the, is the on-site bit of that already, the diesel engine and, and, the, um, and the fuel store, because that's going to be there as a backup when everything else, when everything else fails to ensure that five nines, the 99.999% availability. The piece we're talking about is, is taking a, a um, an alternate view of the other end, the end that we never really thought about too much, which is the grid connection. And that grid connection now, it's that end that we are looking to reinforce with on-site generation, not necessarily, um, although it could it could happen, but not necessarily the complete replacement of the of that that insurance. Uh, you know, we call it standby. I like to think of it of, it, of the insurance energy provision. Um, it, you know when your when your back is completely against the wall. One right. thing to consider is like the gas grid is five nines, data centers are five nines. That's a nice match. The electric grid is more of a three nines, and your weakest link is your fiber grid at something like th three nines also. So um, the reliability of the gas grid is is superior to the electric grid. And, and yeah, that's, that's something we, we, that's something that that was covered 
very uh, early on by Sean in his yeah. slides, but the, I guess it's again, you know, from Ed to all data center engineers, what you've got to understand is that um, the reliability of the grid, the, the gas grid, because it's a self-healing network mm -hmm. is, and I can't, um, David, forgive me for not just jumping on with those numbers and saying that I, you know, I agree with them. I think the grid network uh, availability figures vary according to territory. I don't know what it is, the, the uh, yes. Edwards number is, but, um, you, you know, the, the, the general, the general thing to take on board is if you can overcome this idea of, 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 of primary source moving from, 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 um, electric, the electric utility to the gas utility, once you've mentally jumped over that hurdle, um, is understanding that the utility you're dealing with now is inherently more reliable than the electric utility. Because yeah. it's not subject, and I'm no expert in gas, but clearly it's not subject to the same type of transients and interferences that the electricity grid is. So it's an right. interesting, interesting situation. Right. And, you um, know, these people that you're talking to have probably have a gas burner or water heater that's gas heated in their home and they're flicking a light switch. They're already using gas and electricity interchangeably. Why not do that at a data center? You're doing it at yeah. home already. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's an interesting comparison. So before we go, I think uh, just do, should we just go around the table here? Let's start with Mr. Sedgwick. Anything closing remarks you want to make? Um, yeah, I guess the only the only closing remark I'd, I'd like to make is yeah that I I see you know a, a really exciting uh, as we look to you know as data center operators I and look to build out you know hundreds of megawatts of electrically consuming data centers. I see a really um, a really strong opportunity for data centers to be, you know, to be part of the solution, you know, by making, you know, by either developing on delivering embedded generation assets on site or finding other ways, whether it's through, you know, demand response or embedded batteries or, um, you know, even getting their diesel engines and things participating, you know, providing more services to AgRid, contributing to enabling renewables to system reliability and, and earning an additional revenue stream. Well said. Uh, where next? Let's go to David. Yeah, thank everyone's time for listening today. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, don't go with diesel if it's going to be a stranded, dirty asset. Let's go with natural gas where we can do something a little bit more innovative and uh, forward looking as you invest in these assets for data centers and interactive with the grid. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Reach out if you have any further questions. All right, second that. Okay, so. Um, Let's let's have Sean, please. Closing remarks, Sean. Yeah, certainly. Um, likewise, I'd like to thank everybody for um taking part um today. Um I suppose to, to close on my behalf, um, I'd just like to highlight that look, we, we have an abundant amount of capacity, we have the reliability, we have the expertise, and we have a pathway to a decarbonized gas network. So I'd I'd ask you please challenge your way of thinking um and come and talk to us. Thank you. All right, and then finally, John, John Curley. You're on mute, oh. John. John, you're on mute. Uh -oh, Hello? You're still on mute. John, you're on mute. <laughs> my apologies, is that, is that better? Yeah. I, uh, my, my apologies, Ed. I just wanted to say thank you very much for your moderatorship here this morning. Um, I, it's very much appreciated. Um, I, I, I'd like to thank everybody that attended that has joined us there this morning and, and, uh, and listened to what we've had to say. Hopefully, we have managed to, to debunk some of the, myst the mystery around embedded generation and, and at least made a case for it to be considered in the um, in the overall energy requirement of, of of data centers, and that you know it's 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 technology that is there, it's technology that is pure, and it's not something new. Um, one one thing I would like to just mention at the end is somebody did ask a question, and it's kind of a inherent in me to say that somebody asked a question about uh, the, the the opportunity for combined heat and power. You know, if you put gas engines in, you know, you have that. There is that ability to utilize some of the rejected heat from the from the combustion of the fuel into district heating systems or district cooling systems in that way. So, you know, that is an, another element to this that we haven't discussed this morning, but is something that's worth mentioning. And I thank Paul Boylan for the for his uh, for his question on that.
John, I deliberately, I, deli I deliberately stayed away from that. I saw that question. And I understand yeah. you've got, uh, there are instances where that may, may be possible, but every time we've looked at CHP in the context of data centers, we haven't had the use of the heat. And that's I think the problem. I, I think that's very right. I think though that that you know, it, particularly in the Dublin conurbation, you know, there are there are things happening, you know, particularly in West Dublin, where there is a yeah. a, a, a large confluence of data centres. Uh, we're seeing some stuff there done with South Dublin County Council, who are who are making some real effort to try and develop the possibility of utilising, you know, um, what could be rejected heat for for district for district heating purposes, which is obviously another dimension to energy efficiency and probably speaks to corporate social responsibility for a lot of the, the particularly the hyperscale um, data centers. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a consideration and potentially another benefit, um, not only a fiscal benefit, but also a, um, a, a social corporate responsibility benefit too. Well, wasn't yeah. that also part of the permitting process too, a requirement to be as efficient as possible, the CHP utilization there? That, yeah, the the the, the, the in, in in Ireland as part of the EU Energy yeah. Directive, they you know the the concept of utilising CHP for 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 uh, large scale generation plants is very much part is very much part of that. But as Ed has rightly said, it's the challenge of actually you know is there somebody is there something adjacent to you that you can do that, and that needs a a very collaborative right. approach between the you know potentially social housing authorities and so on like that. I, I, if talking was a was an Olympic sport, I would probably have a gold medal for Ireland at this stage. But uh, so I, I apologise. <laughs> thank you all very much. Uh, thank you to the participants, and and again, thank you, Ed, and and thank you to those people behind the scenes, Tony and Kirsten, who have who have made us all look so look so good this morning. It's much appreciated. Thank you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Have a good day.